Mr. President, the share of world GDP occupied by old Europe is in serious decline. If we exclude the countries that joined in the last uh, enlargement round, the GDP uh, of the world, which was occupied by the 15 old states, 40 years ago was 35%, today is 25% in 15 years' time, will be 15%. Europe is becoming sclerotic, arthritic, because of the economic and social model which we used to pride ourselves on. And there was a time immediately after the war when it looked as though it was working. Paid holidays, paternity leave, what's not to like? You know, limited working hours and so on. But there comes a moment when reality imposes itself, and we have reached that moment now. It now takes four German workers to put in the same amount of hours over the year as three American workers. As a result, US share of world GDP over the last 40 years has remained roughly stable. We're like, a, we're like an elderly couple in a, a once grand house that is beginning to crumble around us, taking our eyes off the developments beyond our doorstep. Our continent as a whole is becoming sterile, <coughs> sclerotic and old. Madam Deputy Speaker, there's been a misunderstanding from the earliest days of the European Union as to what we mean by a free market in goods and services. When my constituents voted in favour of EEC membership in 1975, they understood the common market to mean mutual product recognition. If you can sell a bottle of mineral water in the UK, you should be allowed to sell the same water in France or Germany or Italy and vice versa. What they found in practice is that it means standardisation that the mineral water has to contain the following minerals, but not uh, any of these, that the uh, volume must be not greater than X and not less than Y and so on. And you can then find that a product that was never intended for export can be criminalized in its own nation of origin. And that's what we've seen again and again, both with goods and with services. Instead of having an increase of consumer choice, we have a restriction of consumer choice, often driven by one particular producer somewhere in the European Union, which happens to meet a load of specifications anyway, and which sees EU legislation as the way to export its costs to its competitors, which is why our share of world GDP continues to shrink, and why my country has shackled itself to a cramped and confined regional bloc. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I have a conceptual problem with the idea of this economic harmonization. It takes away what ought to be the main pressure on a government to reform and be competitive. You can raise your taxes up to a certain level before the money starts fleeing to friendlier jurisdictions, your, re your revenues go down and you find that you have to correct it. You can give your workforce the most generous entitlements, paternity leave and maternity leave and holidays and uh, maximum working days up to a certain point before the factories start closing, the jobs start fleeing abroad. One way of thinking of the European Union is that it's an attempt to prevent that process by allowing each country to export its high costs to its competitors. Now, that might have been a feasible model 50 years ago when the main competition was coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. It is plainly not a feasible model when the main competition is coming from China, India, South America, and the rest of it, which is why Western Europe's share of world GDP has halved in the last 40 years and will halve again in the next 20 years. The only way out of this mess is to allow people to compete. 